Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are continuing our discussion of the autonomic nervous system. This is recording part four. Dopamine binds to lots of different adrenergic receptors. At a low dose, that would be less than two mics per kilogram per minute, it binds mostly to the dopamine receptor, which is located in the kidneys. This may increase um, renal vasodilation and cause some diuresis. It also may inhibit renal and splanchnic norepinephrine release. It used to be thought that dopamine at a low dose would help the kidneys function better. It would increase perfusion and increase urine output. The notion of renal dose dopamine is considered outdated. And while it might not do a lot of harm, it certainly doesn't have data to show that it does much good. As we increase the dose of dopamine to say two to 10 mics per kilogram per minute, we see beta-1 receptor activity. So we'll see contractility, increased heart rate and cardiac output. We also see increased myocardial oxygen demand, which can exceed supply. So caution in patients who may have coronary artery disease. At its highest doses, say 10 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, we have alpha-1 receptor activation. So here we'll see increased peripheral vascular resistance, decreased renal perfusion, but we'll also see dysrhythmias, coronary and pulmonary vasoconstriction and increased pulmonary artery pressures. So while it becomes a presser, a vasopressor at this high dose, there are a lot of negative side effects as well. And those are in addition to the side effects that we saw earlier. Epinephrine. Epinephrine is a direct adrenergic agonist. It has different peripheral effects depending on whether it's binding to alpha or beta receptors. So it has alpha receptors in the skin, mucosa, and kidney, beta receptors in skeletal muscle. But primarily when we think about epinephrine, we're thinking about its beta-1 activity, which will increase heart rate and contractility. And as a result, it will increase myocardial oxygen demand. It will increase systolic blood pressure. It also has beta-2 activity, so it's a bronchodilator. It causes some skeletal muscle dilation to increase blood flow to the skeletal muscles for that fight or flight reaction. And it may decrease diastolic blood pressure. Epinephrine also binds to alpha-1 receptors. That will decrease renal blood flow and splanchnic blood flow because of vasoconstriction. And it will increase coronary and cerebral perfusion. Epinephrine has many, many different uses. It can treat anaphylaxis, ventricular fibrillation, and because of its tremendous effects on heart rate and especially blood pressure, patients can have cerebral hemorrhage, coronary ischemia, ventricular dysrhythmias, all from doses of epinephrine. Patients who get epinephrine can get these um, dysrhythmias, and this is worse when patients are receiving volatile anesthetics, especially halothane. Epinephrine dosing, bolus doses come in a lot of different levels. During ACLS, we usually give a milligram IV. You may see glass vials that are one milliliter. We call that one to 1,000 epinephrine, and it has a milligram in it. Or you may see 10 milliliter um, syringes, which are one to 10,000 epinephrine. So they also have one milligram in them. Just to give you the math note, when we say something is one in 1,000, that means it's 0.1%, which is one milligram per milliliter. If a patient is in anaphylaxis or shock, we don't usually need a whole milligram, but the dosing range is pretty wide. It can be anywhere from 10 to 100 micrograms IV, or 100 to 500 micrograms given intramuscular or subcutaneous. Epinephrine can be used as an infusion, typically 0.01 to 0.1 mics per kilogram per minute, same dose as norepinephrine, and this will improve contractility. Epinephrine can be used topically or infiltrative injection to prevent vasoconstriction and decrease bleeding. We often add epinephrine to our local anesthetic solutions, typically at a concentration of 1 to 200,000 to 100, 1 to 600,000, and this prolongs the block by causing vasoconstriction and decreasing um, uptake of the local anesthetic into the systemic circulation. Again, a math note for you. 
how do we get a 1 to 200,000 concentration of epinephrine? If we take 0.1 milliliters of epi from a 1 to 1,000 vial, the little glass vial, and we put it in a 30 milliliter syringe of local anesthetic, it will be 1 to 300,000. If you put it in a 20 milliliter syringe, it will be 1 to 200,000. And obviously, if you put um, half of a cc into a 30 mil syringe, you'll get 1 to 600,000. A few more adrenergic agonists. The next is isoproteranol or isopril. Not a drug that you will encounter very often unless you are in like a cardiac procedure lab. It is a highly potent pure beta-1 and beta-2 agonist. It has no alpha activity. We expect that it will increase heart rate and contractility. And you could use it as an inotrope, but that's really been replaced by more beta-1 specific agonists like dobutamine or phosphodiesterase inhibitors like uh, we'll see in a few minutes. We see a lot of arrhythmias when patients get these beta agonists. We also see increased cardiac oxygen requirement and decreased myocardial perfusion. There may be some coronary artery dilation which causes coronary steal. That means that the diseased arteries don't dilate and the healthy ones do and so even more blood goes to the parts of the heart that are well perfused and less blood goes to the diseased parts of the heart. The beta agonists can decrease systemic vascular resistance because of peripheral vasodilation, but overall we see an increase in systolic, heart, uh, systolic blood pressure because of the increased contractility, and decreased diastolic blood pressure because of the vasodilation. These drugs are good bronchodilators, but they've also been replaced by beta-2 specific agonists. If a patient has complete heart block, you could try to use these drugs to increase heart rate and maintain it until a pacemaker can be placed. Dobutamine is a selective beta-1 agonist. It increases cardiac output by increasing contractility, and so it is an inotrope. Dobutamine also causes coronary vasodilation. A side effect is tachycardia, and dobutamine will increase myocardial oxygen demand. So once again, caution in patients with coronary artery disease. We do see arrhythmias with dobutamine, especially at higher doses, like above 10 mics per kilogram per minute. It has a little bit of beta-2 activity, so it has some pulmonary vasodilation and some systemic vasodilation, so you may see some hypotension in patients when they get dobutamine, so caution in patients who are hypotensive. It also has a little bit of alpha-1 activity, which we don't usually appreciate unless the patient is beta-blocked, and then you'll see it, you'll see primarily alpha-1 activity, which will manifest as hypertension. The dose of dobutamine is 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and it is a fast-onset, short-acting, titratable drug. Milirinone, or Primacor, is not an adrenergic agonist. It is a selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor. But we discuss it here because, like dobutamine, it also increases contractility. Milirinone inhibits cardiac phosphodiesterase 3. This leads to an increase in myocardial cyclic AMP, which facilitates inward movement of calcium and makes the heart contract more, contract more strongly. This is a positive inotropic effect. It also is a vascular and airway smooth muscle relaxer, and so people call milrinone an inodilator. It's an inotrope and a vasodilator. It doesn't have a lot of effect on heart rate or myocardial oxygen demand, so it's better for patients who can't tolerate arrhythmias or who have coronary disease. It's also a very good pulmonary vasodilator, but it will cause decreased SVR and therefore hypotension. The dose of milrinone is usually 50 mics per kilogram over 10 minutes as a loading dose, and then an infusion at 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute. Its onset is slower, about 5 to 15 minutes, and so is its offset, with an elimination half time of about 2.7 hours. It's excreted by the kidneys and may need dosing adjustment in patients with severe renal disease. The last group of drugs we will discuss include clonidine, dexmedetomidine, and other drugs that are in the imidazoline category.
Clonidine, as we've discussed previously, is a selective alpha-2 agonist. It binds selectively to the alpha-2 receptor at a ratio of about 220 times to 1, more selective for alpha-2. It also binds to a receptor called the imidazoline receptor, which is not well understood. Clonidine is used in the treatment of hypertension. It binds to presynaptic alpha-2 receptors. This causes negative feedback as if norepinephrine was present and it therefore reduces additional norepinephrine secretion. It also binds to one of the imidazoline receptors, and this causes vasodilation and hypotension as well. <clears throat> Clonidine does bind to alpha-1 receptors as well, and to another category of postsynaptic alpha-2 receptors. This would cause vasoconstriction and increased blood pressure, and we do sometimes see this paradoxic effect in patients who have clonidine overdose. <clears throat> Clonidine is also used as a sedative. It's used for anxiolysis, and it can decrease MAC. This is probably due to stimulation of the alpha-2A receptors in the vasomotor centers of the brainstem, leading to decreased sympathetic outflow and sedative and hypnotic effects. Other uses of clonidine include its effect against postoperative shivering, as an adjunct for analgesia, where it has been used as an additive to local anesthetics or opioids for epidurals, spinals, and nerve blocks. It has been used in the treatment of opioid withdrawal syndrome. And this imidazoline receptor may be involved in some of the analgesic effects and potentiating the effects of opioids. Patients commonly take clonidine as an oral pill, but it's also available as a patch. <clears throat> it can be given IM, and it is available IV, although not commonly used. The most common side effects of clonidine are bradycardia, hypotension, and dry mouth. What we need to especially appreciate is clonidine withdrawal syndrome. Patients who are stabilized on clonidine and stop taking the medication may present with a hypertensive crisis. If this happens, the treatment would be to either give clonidine or some other vasodilator. Dexmedetomidine is a drug we've discussed before as an even more highly selective alpha-2 agonist used primarily for sedation, although we do see hypotension and bradycardia as a side effect. But keep in mind that hypertension has also been seen, especially with bolus dosing. Dexmedetomidine is also used for its analgesic effect. Other drugs in this imidazoline family include methyl dopa, a drug used for treatment of hypertension, especially in pregnancy-induced hypertension. Methyl dopa primarily acts by inhibiting dopa decarboxylase, the enzyme that converts dopa into dopamine and then norepinephrine and epi. So therefore, it lowers catecholamine levels and lowers blood pressure. But methyl dopa is also metabolized into an alpha-2 agonist, which is similar to clonidine. Other drugs you may have come across that are from this family include tetrahydrozoline, which is visine. This is an alpha-2A agonist, which constricts blood vessels in the eye and relieves redness. And as many people know, you can become, quote, dependent on visine, such that when you stop using it, you develop a withdrawal syndrome. And patients have developed tolerance to this drug, so now stopping the visine may cause a rebound effect and increase redness of the eyes due to vasodilation. An overdose of visine can cause decreased heart rate and blood pressure, dry mouth, sedating effects, and even respiratory depression. Oxymetazoline, which is afrin nasal spray, binds to alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenergic receptors and causes vasoconstriction, and it's used for treatment of nasal congestion and nosebleeds. You can also develop a withdrawal syndrome from afrin, and after several days of use, Ceasing use may cause rebound congestion due to vasodilation. Again, overdose can cause hypertensive crisis and CNS depression. <clears throat> and finally, a drug called guanfacine, or Tenex, which is used in the treatment of ADHD and hypertension. This is also a highly selective alpha-2A agonist. It strengthens regulation of attention and behavior by the prefrontal cortex, and it does that by stimulating postsynaptic alpha-2A receptors on the dendritic spines. Activating these receptors leads to reduced peripheral sympathetic outflow and therefore a reduction in peripheral sympathetic tone, which lowers both 
systolic and diastolic blood pressure. That's it for this topic. Please let me know if you have questions about anything, and we'll see you in the next recording.